say we were going to start. Okay. Uh, yeah, we can go ahead and record this for the record. Uh, but just let me, let's remember uh, the meeting itself starts at five. So, um, uh, in any case, um, so uh, from P TC39, a uh, piece of feedback that both Peter and I felt we had gotten from the committee uh, is that they are interested in SES. Uh, they are not interested uh, in Jesse. Uh, and the reason is that SES is close enough to JavaScript that many JavaScript programs, many existing JavaScript programs run. Um, uh, even uh, Jesse, even though you have the compatibility one way, everything written to Jesse will run as JavaScript. Uh, uh, going the other way, it's such a bizarrely different subset of JavaScript that essentially zero existing JavaScript programs run in Jesse, which, which I do expect to be true. Um, so, um, and, you know, and, and in, in, in uh, explaining uh, to TC39, this fits very well with what I was uh, stating happened to TC53, um, uh, which is, it's really SES that I expect to be trying to advance uh, in TC39. Um, uh, the other thing that um, uh, I did um, uh, state uh, clearly, um, I think not the first time, uh, is that uh, the what had been three layers for us, which is the Realms API on top of that, the Frozen Realms API, and on top of that, uh, the SES, um, that as we've continued work, um, uh, there was not enough difference. Hi, Daria. Uh, there was not enough difference between uh, Frozen Realms and SES. Uh, to preserve the layering difference, so we're collapsing those into one proposal, and we're going to rename the proposal SES. Uh, so that's been stated explicitly. I said I would just rename the proposal, so I will do that. Cool. So actually, we should we should wait until 105 to to actually start and on a topic, um, but we can start discussing what topics we want to be talking about. Um, one of the things that came up um, uh, painfully is the degree to which um, normal JavaScript should remain constrained to be as compatible as possible with SES. Uh, and there was um, uh, the issue of, uh, as JavaScript uh, begins to standardize some APIs that are conceptually resources rather than pure, how should those be provided so that they're well segmented, so that they're well quarantined? from the rest of JavaScript. Um, does anybody else uh, uh, have a topic they would like to talk about today? Um, I would like to talk about <clears throat> integrating SES with Jesse's on JavaScript implementation. Um, and the notable thing that I need to talk about there is how do we do import? OK, good. Good. Um, I was hoping, sorry for the background noise. Um, I was hoping to go over some of the business items um, oh, right. today if uh, any of the Salesforce folks would be on the call. OK. Um, so uh, at such a time that Salesforce folks join, or at least Salesforce folks uh, who should be involved in the business things, meaning uh, Caridi or JF, um, uh, we should indeed uh, switch to that. Um, and it's now 105, so we can um, uh, decide to talk about these things. Um, so I'll go first. Um, so 
the context of this is that uh, I'm a co-champion on two proposals uh, to become part of standard ECMAScript, uh, both of which introduce dangerous things that would need to be censorable or virtualizable um, from, uh, um, uh, you know, for, it, for SES in order to uh, provide attenuated forms of it uh, to confined code. Attenuated forms are simply uh, censored forms. Uh, and uh, those two proposals are uh, error stacks, a standard way to do error stacks, uh, and uh, weak references. And um, weak references also ran into two other tensions on security, on the needs of SES versus um, uh, um, what the people doing, um, the people interested in weak refs outside of SES um, uh, would desire. Um, so uh, the first thing is that um, uh, right now, uh, everything defined as a global variable by the ECMAScript standard, uh, meaning ECMAScript 262, uh, every one of those global variables um, uh, in a frozen realm uh, is effectively powerless with um, uh, two exceptions and one interesting note. Uh, the two exceptions being um, uh, the date and math.random, both of which we've gone over a lot before, and in the default configuration of SES, both of them are made pure. Um, uh, the interesting note is that I've always fretted about uh, internationalization. Uh, it turns out, I don't know if, if this was discovered in one of our meetings or was discovered at TC39, I think it was at TC39, that um, the uh, entire internet, oh, may, no, it's, maybe it was the GitHub issue thread. I'm sorry, I'm very confused as to where I learned this fact, but I did learn that um, you can conform to ECMA 262, the ECMAScript spec, while completely omitting the entire internationalization system, which is uh, ECMA 402. Um, so for purposes of IoT, the TC53 interest, and for purposes, our purposes running stuff on a blockchain, um, uh, both, and, uh, both of those would omit uh, the entirety of uh, the internationalization API. Um, uh, and by omitting it from SES, you still allow it to be provided by a, um, you know, by an SES host or, um, or, or, or virtual host in the same way that uh, any other uh, outside power can be virtualized and passed along. We would just treat internationalization for now as an outside power. Um, the problem... Uh, sorry, uh, one clar clarification here. Um, uh, I'm, I'm just not sure what you mean by virtualization. Um, oh. Are we talking... Uh, yeah, hi, sorry, I kind of jumped in a bit late in the game. Um, so, so uh, are you talking about virtualization in terms of you don't remove it from global, uh, but you don't include it in the realm, and then you have somebody proxying stuff from it that you would trust? So the, um, I think what I'm saying uh, is, is a yes answer to your question, but I'll, I'll, I'll restate it. Um, uh, um, so there is, um, in, the, in the existing normal way of running S SES, and when I say the existing normal way, there's, um, uh, this is uh, in the public repository of the Realm Shim uh, from Agoric. There's another Realm Shim uh, that Agoric and Salesforce are collaborating on that has not been made public yet for which the following scenario would be somewhat different. Um, but uh, in the Agoric uh, realm shim, the way you would um, 
uh, create a, um, a context for running um, untrusted code, but giving it some powers, including how you would do uh, safe modules for running applications, giving their modules the least authority, is that uh, you would have an original realm, which, which, which we've been calling the primal realm, that, have, that has access to the raw powers themselves. And I'm going to use a very nice self-contained example, which is console.log. So console.log is not standardized by ECMAScript. Uh, perhaps it should be, but it's not right now. Uh, if it were standardized, it would, would need to be standardized as a power because it is exactly I.O. to the, to the external world. Um, and so, uh, so in the primal realm, there would be the, um, which is not an SES realm, there would be the original console.log. And then there would be bootstrap code running in the primal realm that uses the SES API to create a new SES root realm. Uh, and then that SES root realm, uh, essentially everything else starting from there would be running in compartments uh, within that one SES root realm. Once you have an SES root realm, there's essentially no need for, um, uh, um, for, other, for other root realms, uh, unless you want to uh, have a different um, uh, configuration of primordial objects. Um, <clears throat> so uh, then let's say that you want to grant console.log. I'm going to ignore the fact that, that SES right now, we just have some ad hoc code making a special case for things like console.log. I'm going to, to, to use it as an example of how we would do it if we were doing it the same way as we do any other power. Um, and we will uh, change console.log over to that once we've got uh, enough support. Um, uh, in any case, so the, um, co the bootstrap code in the primal realm um, would wrap console.log uh, with wrappers that were objects within the SES realm and would install uh, that console.log uh, that might be also attenuating aspects of console.log, depending on what powers you want to provide. Um, uh, but that we would take that wrapper and install it on the, the global of what I'll call the start compartment. And I'm assuming that we're in the, uh, you know, the, 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 legacy safe module support world where, we're, where we are using multiple compartments with multiple globals. Um, so, um, so there would be uh, of the new compartments, so, so sorry, so the bootstrap code would make a root realm and then it would make a, a first compartment within the root realm, which is the start compartment for the application that's going to run. Uh, it would install this um, tamed um, a con a console object, that's, that's our previous terminology, is the original console uh, that's running in the primordial realm is feral, and the wrapper of it that you actually expose to untrusted SES objects is the tame version. Um, so you would install the, the tame console.log on the global object of um, the start compartment for the application. Um, uh, you would do likewise for any other uh, powers that you wanted to provide to uh, the application start. So in the case of Kate's um, uh, uh, to-do list example, um, uh, that would also be the attenuated process object and the um, um, and then separately, you would arrange a, um, a I'm, I, I'm, so uh, we need to get into uh, the actual uh, module namespace to complete the story. Uh, and that's the thing that we're all working on and, and is partially formed. So I'm going to, to skip over that for the moment. 
uh, but the module namespace, um, uh, um, I'm, I'll just skip over that. So, so the, the normally the powers might come through globals, like in this example with console.log, um, or you know the console object, and then um, the start, the code that runs in that start compartment um, uh, would start up uh, other compartments and might grant to another compartment a further virtualization of the console object or might um, simply not provide the console object. It would be up to the, to the code in the start compartment uh, what to do with the attenuation it has, but uh, uh, it could not grant anything more than the attenuated form that it has. Um, uh, so that was a very long answer to a short question. Um, yeah, no, thanks. That really helps. And I think my question was confusing. Um, not that I wasn't confused when I asked it myself, but, but it was really about um, the uh, process of attenuating a global that already exists um, before you make a frozen realm. Um, because I, I think it will factor in the SAS frame for sure. So, so I just wanted to know how, how to deal with things like that. And I think uh, the answer definitely covered that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and it fits, by the way, very well. This thing of virtualized system powers uh, fits very well with um, uh, my, way, my new way of explaining the Realm API. Uh, which has gone over very well in TC39, especially with a lot of the side conversations, but also in the main conversation, uh, which is uh, to uh, explain a realm as a mechanism that allows JavaScript code to act as a, an arbitrary host to other JavaScript code. Um, so there's, you know, or JavaScript already defines this notion of what it is that a host can do and how a host can intervene and what the host hooks are. Um, and those are not principled yet, but ideally they would become principled and <clears throat> whatever it is you expect might vary from host to host. You would also try to enable the creator of a realm to define yet another variant uh, for the code that runs within the realm they create. And that would also enable um, a, uh, uh, code running on one host, let's say node, uh, to use an SES, to, sorry, to use a realm to, um, uh, to create an environment that looks like a browser um, that emulates the browser host environment uh, to code running within a realm it creates and vice versa. You want, you want any host to um, uh, be able uh, to emulate any other host, or at least to you know to the degree that it can within um, JavaScript rules. Um, so, so right now we're in a, a fortunate situation that uh, we can whitelist essentially all of the uh, API defined by ECMA two sixty two. Uh, with regard to internationalization, we had a rude discovery at this meeting um, that makes it very fortunate that we can omit it completely, uh, which is um, it turns out that the current time leaks through internationalization as well. Uh, there is some um, uh, call in the internationalization library. I'm not familiar with the library myself, so I haven't looked and therefore my memory might be a little bit inaccurate here, but I believe there's some call that lets you create a date range and both the beginning and the ending arguments are optional. And if omitted, then it creates a, the, you know, the right internationalization uh, API object for representing that end of the date, but it uses um, uh, the current date and time, and that leaks time down to the second. Um, uh, one possibility going forward is at the realm level, um, uh, but not of concern at the SES level, at the realm level, what we probably want to do 
is to provide a time hook or a now hook so that the creator of a realm can provide a source of time and then any built-in thing in the created realm that, that is trying to perceive the current time using the built-in uh, gets the one created by the creator of the realm. Gets, gets the one provided by the creator of the realm. Um, uh, but in any case, um, uh, what I'm leading up to here is that we're about to introduce into JavaScript uh, magic primitives that break normal OCAP safety rules and therefore should not be uh, available by default, just like the current time should not be available by default. Um, so uh, with stack traces, um, there is um, a existing API, um, which is uh, present in the primordial objects, which is for from an error object, you can say error object dot stack. And what we've specified in our proposal is that um, that property is actually defined on uh, error dot prototypes and it's inherited by the error instances, which was what Mozilla actually does. So we know it's web compatible, um, but we've also moved it into Annex. We're proposing that that part of the stack API be in Annex B so that a conforming implementation can remove it. And the SES implementation does remove it. Um, uh, but in its place, uh, there are um, uh, um, separate operations, powerful operations, which is get stack and get stack string that make the same information available by other means. And those are defined um, uh, right now, the proposal has them defined on the system object, which is a namespace object like math, uh, where we've proposed that all special powers come from the system object. And the reason for that is that secure code, like an SES shim, um, uh, can, can know that that's where uh, special dangerous things are, uh, and therefore can easily omit it or only allow the things that it knows how to attenuate and censor everything else or whatever. Uh, but basically, um, uh, preserve the system versus user mode distinction that right now we have as a boundary between ECMA and host uh, to preserve that distinction even when uh, TC39 defines some system objects. Uh, the reason that the stack is dangerous is you're peering into computation in a way that violates the encapsulation of the computation. And those powers of peering into it can um, uh, reveal secrets that were um, uh, the uh, internal states of algorithms. And from that, you might be able to infer uh, precious secret information. Um, uh, the um, so, so specifically with that, the political thing that's happening at TC39 uh, is that there is resistance to putting these things on the system object. There's resistance to, uh, you know, creating a namespace object as opposed to uh, just making these things global. Um, uh, the other um, uh, uh, Jordan Harband, uh, my co-champion on the Aristax proposal, also has a very nice proposed alternative uh, to the system object, uh, which is much more whitelisting oriented than blacklisting oriented, uh, which is also very nice from a security point of view, uh, which is, actually, before I say this, I should say what the constraint on the design is. We want old securing code, like an SES shim, old securing code that was safe for the version of ECMAScript that it had deployed for to remain safe under new versions of ECMAScript uh, and therefore um, be able to um, uh, censor 
powerful things that it didn't know about, uh, while at the same time having it not censor new, powerless, pure if frozen things that it didn't know about. We would like the old code to be compatible with the, the platform rolling out new safe things and new unsafe things without the old code censoring the new safe things. Um, uh, so that's, that's the, the, uh, the safety constraint we want. Um, so then the question is, how does the old code tell the difference? And uh, we want the powerful things being introduced by existing proposals, uh, stacks and weak references, uh, to obey whatever that boundary is. Um, because this is the time to set the precedent. If we don't set the precedent now, if we just say, oh, well, SES can make an exception for these, just like it makes an exception for date, then each one will just be an incremental cost. And before you know it, there'll be a hundred exceptions and no general mechanism. Um, uh, so um, Jordan's proposal is that there be an explicit safe whitelist, a whitelist that you can ask the platform for um, uh, that will list the names of all of the globals that would be pure if hardened. Um, uh, and it simply omits new powerful things. And the thing about asking the platform for it is then it's the, the old safe code is, is up to date with whatever platform it's running on. You don't have uh, the coordination problem of the whitelist versus the version of the platform. It simply always describes the platform it itself is on. Um, and if there is a mistake, uh, shimming code can still, um, uh, 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 you know, prior vetted shims can, could still repair the whitelist to repair the mistake in cases where there is a mistake, but it would default um, uh, to, to uh, working in the safety preserving way. Uh, another possibility that I discussed with Daniel Ehrenberg um, uh, for yet another powerful thing to introduce, which is um, uh, how do we want to introduce the ability to perceive the current time in a principled way if we've censored it from the date object uh, is um, uh, built-in modules. Uh, we want built-in modules in general to be um, pure or, or pure if, if hardened um, uh, or, or pure if there is some, some meta operation to just you know, state by fiat that they're pure, which is a, a corresponds to what XS does. Um, uh, but we also uh, could have some distinction within the built-in module system uh, so that um, the Realm creator in configuring a module namespace could understand that built-in modules that it didn't know about, of built-in modules that it didn't know about, which one the platform says it should treat as pure and which ones the platform describes as sources of authority. And uh, any, and so, this issue about how to do the, how to represent the dichotomy is a design issue. There are probably other, you know, once you have three examples, there are probably other ways to do this that we haven't thought of yet. Um, uh, but this is a real tension uh, because uh, people who don't care about SES on the committee see this as an API design cost that SES is making mainstream JavaScript pay. Uh, how clear was that? I, I, having gone into holding forth mode again, I, I, I'd like some feedback on to, as to whether that was understandable. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, 
So the, the idea is by introducing a new API that only SES would be, be interested in using, that's not going to be a burden on anybody else. Yeah, so like, the, like Jordan's thing um, uh, where you have the whitelist, uh, adding a whitelist uh, would not be a burden because uh, everyone else would just see the global variables they wanted to see. Right. Um, uh, and likewise, uh, uh, if the built-in module distinction did not impede the usability of the built-in modules, uh, then that also uh, would not create pushback. There is a staging issue here, um, uh, which is uh, built-in modules are not even yet proposed. Nobody has a proposal yet, so we don't know what they're going to look like. Um, the browser has done something for built-in modules, uh, which uh, says, you know, which lays a precedent as to what hosts must be able to define, uh, since the browser is one of the hosts, but it's not a precedent yet that is too constraining of what uh, JavaScript built-in modules look like. Um, uh, there is a, um, another proposal, which is the one that Dan was thinking, Daniel Ehrenberg, uh, was, um, ha was dis that was the context for the discussion that we had, which is moment, uh, which is being proposed, uh, as a pure, um, uh, a pure built-in module. It's ex an existing widely used JavaScript library. Um, uh, uh, the proposal would omit the part of the moment API uh, that requires moment to know the current time. Uh, that it, that that's already part of the moment proposal, so that already has that's already acceptable to the committee. Um, Dan has no problem with that, uh, but given that, um, uh, where does the capability? to obtain the current time such that you can feed it into moment and get moment functionality uh, that's applied to the current time. Uh, and that's where um, a current time built-in module that is somehow considered part of a bundle with moment, but has factored out the dangerous part of moment into a separate thing. Um, uh, and, I, and I like that. That means that in general, um, uh, when somebody wants to um, package stuff as modules, where there's some power there, they can package it divided into all the computational uh, functionality, like rendering and parsing and, and date interval and date arithmetic. Uh, put all the computational services, the transformational services in a pure module, and then the special magic um, uh, uh, powerful things that have to be built on, on system powerful things um, uh, be in a um, uh, come, come along for a ride in the same overall package, but in a separate set of modules that can be treated separately. Um, and moment um, uh, is on a time frame where uh, it might be not irritating to all of the stakeholders uh, for um, moments to come in on top of built-in modules. In fact, that's sort of what, what many people are assuming because Moment has a, is a very, very large API with many objects and a lot of API surface. And it would be very painful to just include all of those objects in the built-in primordials. So, you know, as this group proceeds to define safe modules for SES, uh, we can also have as a subtask of that um, uh, to, uh, in, the sh in our shim, actually uh, do something to emulate uh, 
uh, what we would like to propose as, for built-in modules, including the separation. Um, and then uh, that would be a basis for uh, weighing in on how built-in modules should get standardized in ECMAScript. Oh, and I have a piece of uh, very good news. I think um, we had discussed here previously uh, the import maps coming from the browser. Uh, at the time, um, I really did not understand them yet. That was really my, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, Dominic gave a talk, not at TC39, but at another JavaScript event immediately following TC39 uh, that I attended. Uh, he gave a talk on import maps and said separately, Dan Daniel Ehrenberg and I talked for a long time um, uh, uh, in a side conversation about import maps. And I think import maps and our uh, legacy safe module manifest have a lot of conceptual overlap uh, to the point that uh, um, uh, we should just be able to adopt a large portion of uh, the built-in module proposal as, I'm sorry, the built-in import map proposal, excuse me, the built-in import map proposal uh, replace that portion of our manifest uh, with uh, the, car the corresponding functionality from import maps. Uh, import maps, there's one global one per application, which is global in exactly the same sense that we've um, uh, been saying that our manifest is global. Um, uh, and uh, then the way in which you express the remapping uh, seems to have, well, uh, seems to be as expressive as our manifest and not too expressive in any way that I've seen that creates dangers. But it was only one talk and one offline conversation, so I might have missed something. And that's why I'm being care very careful to say uh, the applicable subset of import maps. I don't actually know of anything dangerous. So the ideal outcome is that we would just um, uh, use import maps in safe modules and then propose it uh, 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 to note in the short term and to TC39 uh, as a language-wide uh, mechanism for the longer term. That sounds good to me. Um, so this is a this is a proposal, right, uh, to the ECMAScript committee already. So there it is. Be, it, it, it is not right now. Oh, it is it, right now. It is only on the browser and is only a proposal to the W3C what way? It's only a proposal on the website. Oh, I see, got it. Okay, right. um, maybe we can talk offline about the best way to integrate that. Um, yeah, yeah. What, one, that actually, good. yeah one, one conceptual mismatch that uh, Daniel and I did talk over is that um, the import maps coming from the browser, uh, think of the result of name resolution always being a URL. But neither Daniel nor I saw anything in the mechanism that makes it specific to URLs. Uh, but that would be something to watch out for, uh, is that um, uh, uh, URLs sort of imply this global namespace of the internet that you're giving uh, access to, uh, whereas strings whose meaning um, uh, is created by the loader uh, are very different. Obviously, those strings could have the form of a URL, but, it, but the URL form suggests the wrong thing. Oh. Um, another thing I wanted to bounce off of everyone here is that um, uh, having two two-hour meetings a week is a large time commitment. Uh, and um, uh, 
uh, from talking to some people that used to participate, uh, my sense, um, uh, well, it was, um, I asked them directly. Um, uh, and I think that if we uh, dropped this meeting down to one two hour meeting a week, pick either the Tuesday time slot or the Thursday time slot, um, uh, it would be, we would, um, might get more attendance back. And the reason why this came up is actually that it's also a large time commitment for me every week. And uh, I've got, um, even though it's central to what I'm doing, I've got enough other things to do to actually act on the ideas that we talk about here uh, that I'd like to drop it to one of these sessions a week. Um, I've got both, um, I've got one requirement, reported requirement that it be Thursday since one person that I talked to could not attend Tuesday. And from another person, I got a very, very strong preference for Tuesday since they would find it painful to attend Thursday. Um, uh, um, do you guys have um, any strong preference between Tuesday and Thursday? Either way should work for me. Either works for me. Oh, and um, let's see. Uh, so, uh, Sala? Uh, yeah, either works for me as well. Okay, good. And I see uh, Daria dropped out. So, um, uh, that is a unanimous, either one works for me. Um, I'm going to because the constraints I've got, one was a hard constraint and the other one was a strong preference, uh, I hereby pick Thursday until um, uh, we get pushback that it was the wrong decision. Sounds good. But that will include um, two days from now. So that'll be the first Thursday only. Okay, um, uh, I think um, those were the, that was the most important thing to report from TC39. Um, another thing to report is that um, the idea of proceeding forward to define SES and get committee su uh, support for it as a defined subset of the language and a defined API for creating it as a enforced subset within an ECMAScript system uh, that has broad support in the committee. Um, uh, uh, the thing that's controversial is to what degree the, the anticipated SES should constrain what the language looks like um, uh, in non-SES. Uh, and if there's already some incompatibility there, which is we freeze the primordials. That means not 100% of ECMAScript code runs. Uh, and that means that we could admit other such discrepancies over time. Sorry, uh, Michael, I, I, but I'm just finished this thought. We could uh, admit other such discrepancies over time, but I expressed in pushing back on that, I expressed that um, the problem is the death of a thousand cuts is everyone seems small and in aggregate, um, uh, you've created a new language and no JavaScript code ports anymore. The only reason that we're in the, in the fortunate situation we're in is we've been so careful not to admit things incompatible with SES into the language and to admit things uh, in a way that is SES compatible. Okay, Michael. Uh, yes, <clears throat> so Sala and I have been discussing the possibility of a Jesse frame in the browser. Um, and basically, the, the main things around this are uh, taming the UI enough that we can use the service worker and CSP approach that he was talking about earlier for SES frame. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, oh no, I, I'm sorry. I'm very glad you mentioned that because I also talked to Daniel Ehrenberg about what would be needed to use something like service workers as an enforcement mechanism. So that's directly relevant. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah. 
So the main impedance mismatch we have between what I currently have for a Jesse interpreter and what SES will take as interpreted code um, is that SES does not support import. Uh, the the so, SES, propo SES proposes to support import, uh, but uh, that's what we're currently designing um, and also currently working towards. Uh, right. but, but, but yeah, the, the shim does not support import. So, so what I'd be curious about is how can we get there from here and um, in turn support environments that in general might not have import either. And I, I guess there are two main approaches that I see, one of which is to just say Jesse code is implicitly a bundle because it does not use dynamic import. So it doesn't really need first class import. Um, and another approach would be to do something where we do asynchronous import and then make the resulting imported modules available to uh, a namespace to evaluate with. I'm sorry, I did, I did not under, uh, state, state the second one again. The second one, so, so this would be to actually interpret the import statements and uh, make them asynchronous so that the actual running code in the module ah. would be a function body that would receive the imports. Got it. So where where um, SES is not, so in the second approach, SES is not running as a subset of SES. I'm sorry, Jesse is not running as a subset of SES. Uh, it's running as a language interpreted by SES code. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Um, I would like to, uh, uh, I would like to have a plan to get to uh, imports being directly supported by SES in a way that's adequate for Jesse's purposes uh, sooner rather than later. Okay. Um, so uh, the interest, the nice simplification there is that um, uh, Jesse only supports pure modules um, uh, and uh, the overall safe module work for SES has pure modules as a component. Uh, so the right development order in any case is to start with pure modules. Um, uh, the uh, the, there's a layering constraint on safety that I would like to preserve, uh, which is um, uh, for uh, SES does not parse JavaScript, and JavaScript is notoriously hard to parse, and um, even if you get a parser correct, you're getting it correct for one version of JavaScript and you might be running on a platform that has another version of JavaScript. Um, uh, so uh, what I would like to do is to preserve uh, the, the SES. This is specifically a, a uh, issue of layering the implementation of the shim. It is not an issue uh, with regard to what to specify. Right. Um, uh, but for the shim, uh, I would like the existing tiny SES kernel um, to only have evaluators because we can do that. We can do safe evaluation without parsing. Mm -hmm. And then to do a source to source transformation of modules into evaluable scripts. Okay. Um, such that we can then uh, implement the module system. Uh, in terms of endowments to evaluable scripts. Uh, and there's a intermediate development step for getting there, uh, um, which has pros and cons. But what we were thinking is um, common JS modules uh, already are evaluable scripts rather than separate syntax that needs to be parsed. Um, so we could support, um, uh, we, we could have, we could basically get our 
safe module mechanism working more quickly in a way that was usable more quickly if we did um, uh, pure modules for common JS first um, and then at a, at a higher level uh, did a translation, um, uh, uh, did a semantics preserving translation from import export to common JS modules uh, but what I just said uh, has a big um, uh, impedance mismatch. Uh, they have um, uh, b um, uh, the two module systems are different. What I have not thought through, maybe you have, is do the semantics, do the, do the differences between the two module systems uh, affect the semantics of the Jesse subset? of those module systems? I would venture to say no, uh, that this is a more an issue for the interpreter or for the validator before we present the Jesse module to the okay. environment. So what that suggests is that we could start with a very simple translation for which we know in what way it, it has a um, semantics changing hazard. Um, uh, which is um, uh, basically just turn import into require and turn the set of exports into the assigning of um, uh, an exports record. Um, yes. And uh, clearly that um, uh, does not preserve for the larger SES language, that does not preserve the semantics of ECMAScript modules but it would allow, I think that would enable um, uh, Jesse to run immediately on top of, as, as a subset of SES, once we have those two pieces in place. Does that sound plausible? Yeah, that's, yeah, that seems exactly right. And that would, um, that to me is exactly the, the kind of transformation we need to do. And, it's not just SES that this is an issue for, it's any environment that doesn't support imports. We, in, in some ways, we have to implement the same rewrite or code transformation to get it into a, a form that the environment can ha handle. So it's not, a, it's not an onerous thing to do that for SES. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Um, Oh, oh, another relevant thing here, which I think, I think this plan fits with perfectly well, is that uh, for embedded, uh, the XS engine um, is very, very interested. I mean, the TC53 is very, very interested in supporting SES. And uh, the um, Modable, who creates the XS engine, uh, is uh, very interested in creating a configuration of the XS engine that uh, is directly an SES engine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I think we've, yeah, we've talked about that extensively before in these meetings. Um, the interesting thing there is the typical and desired modable configuration uh, is that uh, the ECMAScript running at runtime running on the device does not have any runtime evaluators. Uh, their module, they, they only support ECMAScript modules. They do not support common JS modules. Uh, and for the uh, configuration where there's no runtime evaluation, uh, basically all of the module initialization and linkage all happens at build time. Mm -hmm. And therefore, their, their uh, module initial state is pure by configuration. Um, uh, and, uh, um, and that means that um, uh, what they're, we would need to take a look at how they're using modules and make sure that uh, the plan of moving that to SES fit with the idea that those modules were safe pure SES modules.
Yes, uh, that seems totally reasonable. That's that's very much a similar approach as to how I was envisioning Jessica working on other platforms. Good. Um, so just to put in a little bit of plug for Jesse Frame, um, essentially what Sal and I are working on is uh, an an iframe whose content security policy limits it to requesting things from its service worker, and then uh, embedding a Jessica validator within the service worker so that the only modules you can load are valid Jesse code. Say all of that again, please. Sure. Um, so basically, from within a Jesse frame, uh, they could use import statements and script statements and so on, but all of this, all the script code would be validated through a service worker that uh, checks to see that it's valid Jesse code and passes all the static requirements. So then what we still need is some implementation of SES to limit the endowments. Mm -hmm. Uh, and is the plan um, uh, is the plan to give the um, the Jesse code uh, direct access to the DOM within the frame uh, uh, and depend only on C CSP to reduce the power directly pro so CSP and this interception to reduce the power. Uh, that's implied by direct access to a DOM node? Uh, that's the hopeful uh, plan. <laughs> um, we'd have to be very careful and understand exactly what we're getting into first. But uh, if, if CS, is my microphone doing something weird? I hear strange things. Um, uh, you sound normal on this end. Okay, good. Um, so the reliance on CSP uh, and the validation of the external resources should be the right combination to get. Basically, there's a bootstrap requirement where we have to ensure that any scripts that are in line in that frame are sanitized through the validator before we can even start the whole service worker process of loading the other resources. So uh, what Saha was working on is basically saying, with CSP, we can limit where the resources come from. And if that isn't the case, then we need some way of falling back to say that it's not safe and not to do it. Okay. So from talking to Daniel Ehrenberg, um, the, um, uh, there's two problems with service workers that we talked about. Um, uh, and I should say that I'm sufficiently unfamiliar with them that I, don't have, I have no confidence that there are not problems beyond the two that we talked about. Uh, but the two that we talked about are that service workers do not, if, 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 if you don't already have the service word worker running and you load a frame that is supposed to go through a service worker, that code in the frame can start running prior to the service worker um, uh, coming up and being interposed. And there's an existing proposal for I think it's called intercept on load or something like that, um, uh, where it would be the case that code within the frame was delayed until the service worker was in place. That would be very good for us. Um, uh, the other thing that we talked about is a service worker is scoped to an origin. So all the requests from the page to that origin would go through the service worker, but all of the requests from the page to other origins would not. And the reason that's the case for service workers is they think of the service worker as being a local proxy for a remote host, where it's a remote host at an origin, rather than thinking of it as a wrapper around the code in the frame. Yes, correct. So uh, this is where CSP would be mandatory for us, where essentially we could say on the site, 
that's hosting the, the code that's running in the, in the browser. We can do things to make sure that if they get past a service worker or don't have one, then they still get something sane from the site. Um, but on the other side, we do need to make sure that the, the code within the, within the frame does not make any reference outside of that uh, origin. So does, I just, I just don't know. I know CSP eval allows you to suppress evaluation, uh, which clearly is necessary here. Um, Actually, uh, by intercepting the, the, or the first page and putting it into a template element, as Sal had, had said, uh, we can do transformations on that, that DOM fragment without it activating the scripts. Uh, template as in web components template? Uh, template tag, yes, it's HTML5. Okay, and the template tag suppresses I.O.? Uh, yeah, it's basically an inert DOM fragment. Okay, right, good, good, I forgot about that. Yeah, we did talk about that before. Um, okay, yeah, this sounds, this sounds uh, promising. Um, yeah, if we can, if we can make, if we can provide uh, sanely attenuated direct DOM access, um, uh, that would just be awesome. Um, and, and it turns out that the Jesse case is more difficult than the SES case. <laughs> so uh, it will be a, it will be a good first step to getting something that's workable that we can turn into SES frame. Uh, sorry, which one do you say was more difficult? Uh, the Jesse case, simply because we have to do uh, parsing of the, the code that we get. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, given that, why not start with SES? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I mean, the, in the same way that we're strategizing a development order for how do you get uh, ECMAScript modules and, you know, cover, you know the, I, the, the strategizing development order uh, to the degree that we can, that the first steps uh, only have work that's necessary anyway yeah. and make the thing more widely usable. It would seem that even though you might only be interested in running Jesse, that um, uh, uh, having the browser mechanisms be built to be safe for SES code would allow a lot of other uses of that same mechanism. And in particular, I'm thinking uh, very strongly of MetaMask. Mm -hmm. uh, use uh, SES in the browser. Um, uh, they're very, very um, important uh, for us. So we want to be able to support that as soon as we can. Um, so is there any reason not to do um, uh, safe browser containment for SES first? I, I think the simplest way of putting it is that uh, we will have safe browser containment for SES and then applying a Jesse parser to the input is just an option for that. So I don't, I don't see them as being a separate thing necessarily and that's what Sal and I were talking about is having it be the same project essentially. Okay. So just Good. as you can pick your console dot, uh, your console dot login, your date time options, it would be something where you could say, I want to ensure that the code is transformed by such and such a function before we load it. Okay, this sounds excellent. And um, uh, what are the open questions regarding whether these mechanisms are adequate to provide direct DOM access? Uh, more familiar with more familiarity with the DOM. Um, I, I understand that uh, basically as long as we can sanitize the JavaScript code, the DOM can't really 
exert any authority besides in the frame. And we can remove the parent, the parent reference from the frame as well, so they can't get out. Um, but yeah, that that's that's something that I have passed some familiarity with and experience with, but haven't got the same depth of understanding that Sala has. And he's basically the one working on that part. And the suppression of evaluation uh, by CSP uh, would be able to suppress, for example, a code with direct DOM access, uh, creating a script tag that causes data, computed data to be executed as code. Uh, yeah, that would have to be a good question because we do want to inject some some uh, tags and evaluation into the frame itself without yeah. having it depend on the parent. So, well, and, and in particular, if you're giving direct DOM access, uh, then you cannot prevent the code to which you've given direct DOM access of using the DOM API to create new nodes of their design. Hmm. What you can do is suppress the power that's implied by creating that DOM structure through other means uh, if we can do that. So can I, um, can I pitch in here? Um, the reason why I thought uh, Jesse would be uh, an easier target than, than SES is because of um, the language, has, like the, the subset has a very, very uh, restricted um, a number of moving parts. And I thought of eval uh, and import, by the way, uh, the dynamic function. Um, as, um, as things that we could actually um, uh, eval, we can replace the global eval, um, and then we can um, sanitize eval code that is being evaluated even if it's not Jesse code. Um, uh, so, so, I'm sorry, the uh, SES already does replace the global eval with an SES eval. Yeah. So what what's not adequate about that? No, no. I mean, I mean, if the SES frame is allowing more complexity because it allows more of the language, uh, Jesse frame, my, in my opinion, was a good start uh, because it has a subset, a smaller subset, and in that subset, my concerns were eval and import. So I I do uh, like I know that SES does replace the global eval. Um, but as to your concern uh, about how to handle eval, um, before I before I um, you know came to the conclusion. Oh, oh then let me clarify my question. Yeah. Uh, uh, SE, um, uh, uh, you know, SES handles eval through JavaScript evaluators perfectly well. That's not what I'm worried about. I'm worried about uh, access to the DOM, uh, doing things like creating script tags. Uh, yeah. uh, bringing in evaluation by other means, and I th and I think I think the CSP is say enables us to suppress yeah. that. I wanted to verify that. Definitely. Uh, so CSP eliminates the ability for script tags to execute. Okay. Uh, you might create them, but they will throw or not execute at the very least. Okay. Good. And yeah. uh, as far as um, uh, you know, uh, various tags, uh, script or image or, or, or whatever, having a, um, uh, a source equals and then a URL string, uh, we can through CSP for all of those, we think, suppress fetching, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. from the templates, we can, we can uh, suppress the fetching of those URL strings because they're in a template. Okay, good. So good. Yeah, like uh, initially the idea with SES is uh, you want to uh, allow people to actually import their resources, right? But with Jesse Frame, the idea was that SRC um, needs only to point to um, uh, Jesse code. Um, and uh, that goes through the service workers. So, so I think a, a more uh, simplified CSP policy to, uh, to prevent SRC on scripts uh, or um, href on iframe would be a good start um, until we have that in place. And then we can start talking about um, 
what assets are and what is the idea of an, a Jesse frame inside a Jesse frame, you know, all these complexities, uh, I think will will have to be addressed uh, once we have a prototype in place. So in what way, with regard to the browser safety side of the engineering, uh, yeah. in what way does doing this for Jesse enable the browser side mechanisms to be in any way simpler than doing it for SES? Um, so with SES, I'm uh, struggling um, with, um, you know, um, organizing my thoughts, let's put it this way, um, on the uh, broadness of sources that need to be validated before executed. So I can't, in my head, I'm not coming up with a concrete plan on, um, you know, the steps I need to take to make the prototype um, so that I would actually be able to um, um, capture any reference to code that is being fetched uh, in the right sequence. So I, I, I think it's, it's not that a plan is hard to come by, but rather that the problem is too big for me that I'm getting distracted um, away from, um, you know, implementing the, the uh, foundation of the whole thing. Um, so with Jesse Frame not allowing other uh, ECMAScript code, and in fact only allowing code to that will actually be validated by somebody else's distraction, um, I'm able to say, okay, I'm not going to try to solve a problem before I actually see it. Okay. So let me just you know remind everybody that um, uh, uh, the SES shim uh, uh, provides safety with essentially zero validation. Uh, and that SES itself, as specified, uh, would provide safety with zero validation. True, um, true. Um, but, but to an extent, what we were talking about um, um, in SES and the demos I've seen is that you're getting code that has so some sort of, um, you know where you're getting your code from. You're not, like when we were running SES uh, in the demo, it was a roll of bundle created from a particular source. But as soon as we go to the web, uh, a source can be a different source uh, and, and look exactly the same in code. Um, and so, so there's the asset um, uh, pre-parsing or the asset pre-graph that is being done in, by the service worker um, that needs to kind of uh, give the same assurance that the sources that are coming are not, you know, hijacked um, in the remote uh, space. Um, so, so I'm not sure exactly how deep we need to dig there. Um, and I can't really create a clear image to move forward um, with that complexity in the way. Um, so to my, to my knowledge, um, it, the, the benefit of, of the Jessica um, uh, validation is that it takes that um, problem out of my scope completely uh, until I put the same foundation that we need for SES frame uh, in a smaller problem space. So uh, there is one technical concept that, that you mentioned there that is, prob is probably crucial and one I never heard of before. Uh, probably because I, I never really dug into service workers. Uh, you talked about an asset graph when you were talking about yes. the, uh, that's a service worker thing? No, that's the thing I'm trying to do to, or I'm trying to um, put in, in some term or some definition um, about if I'm going to be loading something from a URL, but I'm going to be remapping those URLs against the service worker URL. Um, on the web, you have many domains and many sites refer to assets across multiple domains. We will have to come up with a strategy where if you're importing from a CDN, the jQuery library, um, you're importing the jQuery library um, against a path-based uh, rewrite 
that is idempotently identical um, to the service worker requesting it from the CDN. Um, that mapping that will happen requires us writing potentially URLs with multiple origins against a uh, path, you know, a prefix path that is only um, um, resolvable by the service worker. It does not exist in reality. And in doing this kind of mapping, um, you will be getting modules that will have to, at some point, refer to each other. So you want to know that you're not rewriting something and breaking its linkage to something else. Um, so if I'm getting an asset that is importing another asset, um, the fact that the service worker um, serves it to um, a local uh, path name, um, at some point there might be conflict whether or not the URL should be remapped in the source or should be remapped um, outside by the service worker, with, which does not exist today. So this is the feature that I think we will be asking for um, from the web community. It's the ability to remap URLs uh, before loading a page. Um, but since we don't have that, the remapping has to occur in the service worker for now. Um, sorry, I jumped around a bit. Yeah, I, I, I was, as, uh, so I, I think I got a lot of that, but I failed to find how the difference between Jesse and SES, um, yeah. uh, you know, how, how, how that difference affects any of this. Okay, uh, just, to, just to interject here, Sala. Yeah, yeah, so this understanding that we need the same uh, execution environment for our safety um, is the bottom line here. And that's, I think, addresses a lot of Sala's concerns about uh, different origins and so on. But to get, to have something that uh, works within, within Jesse frame, for example, uh, might be too constrained of an environment to use for SES frame. So solving the... Can, sol can, you, can you give an example of, uh, uh, of what mechanism you might build that would be adequate for Jesse frame, but insufficient for SES frame? Uh, a situation that I'd have is uh, a public website that serves user content. Um, okay. And to allow scripts and other, and other code to import only from that site, for example. Okay. Um, in that situation, we are constraining where the Jesse frame can go. But in the general SES frame, I think we would want to lift that restriction more. Um, for Jesse frame, we can say with confidence, we know we're getting all of it from this one site because of the content security policies and so on. But okay, when, so we want, when we want to open it to URLs in the wider internet, for example, that would take more work in my opinion. Okay, so, the, so if I'm understanding, the issue really is not... It, it's not the execution of code. It's not the technical, it's none of the technical differences between SES and Jesse. Rather, it's the developer expectations that would follow from something supporting SES versus something supporting Jesse. Something supporting SES, developers would expect to pull things in cross-origin because we're supporting, we're doing so much work to support some legacy code. Whereas with Jesse, you're sending a clear signal that uh, you have to rethink from scratch which, you know, which web mechanisms are supported. Is that, is, am I getting it? Is this, what, is, this, is this what you're saying about why start with Jesse Frame? Definitely, yeah. So, so uh, solving um, the problems that are, you know, in my uh, scope, um, require me not to get distracted in potential problems that are much, much bigger than what you would expect a Jesse frame to be able to do. That's a, that's a good uh, rehashing of that. So with SES, you, you expect the entire platform. Uh, with Jesse frame, you know that the entire platform may never be supported. Uh, so you're looking for what would work. 
um, and um, you know it's a gradual um, um, process for me to 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 address um, you know um, issues that I might not be prepared to address at this point. So let me make a su suggestion, which is you know. Right now, uh, SES doesn't support the browser at all. Um, having SES support the browser where all of the content in the frame had to come from one origin would be a tremendous, huge step over where we are. Uh, and if that's the degree of, of expectation violation that you're worried about, uh, I would really I, I mean, I'll just, I think that's a, um, those additional expectations are something that we can worry about much later and, and, and you know, it can be you know, solved in a much later development step. Uh, this earlier development step would open up tremendously more use of SES. Uh, and I would be pretty sure that uh, the MetaMask use of SES would be perfectly fine with this restriction. Uh, I, I will ask, but as, as an example, I think it would be perfectly fine with this restriction. A lot of the use cases I have in mind would be perfectly fine with this restriction. So let me just su suggest as a development strategy that um, you know, conceive of the, um, the mechanisms that you want to build to support Jesse Frame uh, go ahead and build them with the intention of using them to build Jesse frame. Uh, but for all of the browser side mechanism that you're building when you do that, uh, just let's continually ask the question of um, would this work for SES? And in fact, let's do it in an iterative fashion where we can continually also try it with SES to just see if there's any mismatch there. Yes. Um, so from my perspective, that's precisely the way we're going to go. And uh, the, the only difference between Jesse frame and SES frame version zero is validator equals Jessica. That's it. And, and then you get the same environment in both situations. Okay. That's ideal. I love that. Hey, Mark. Um, I think I must have misunderstood something. I, I thought you said a while back that uh, SES doesn't work in the browser. Uh, SES, no, SES works in the browser. Uh, uh, what I meant is, yes, I see, I see, I did, I did misspeak. Um, I didn't mean to imply that SES doesn't work in the browser. What I meant is that SES uh, currently cannot be safely exposed, or ra rather untrusted code um, uh, as confined by SES if you give it unattenuated access to a DOM node, you've basically lost confinement. We do not have the mechanism needed to, uh, and, and Kate, thanks for catching that, especially because this is you know, recorded to be posted. Um, uh, uh, in Kaha, um, we had Kaha as a whole being an, a, a, um, uh, a system to do uh, uh, web content safely, where web content includes HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Um, SES was the JavaScript component of that that we've now rebuilt much better. Uh, but Kaha also had a component called Domato. Uh, let me just, since I'm talking about Kaha, it also had an HTML source to source rewriter and a CSS source to source rewriter. Uh, but those were not nightmares. Uh, the nightmare was Domato, which was essentially a handcrafted ad hoc membrane uh, sitting between the untrusted SES code and the actual browser DOM API. And the reason it was a nightmare is that uh, the DOM API uh, is one of the worst APIs that human beings have ever created. Um, uh, it probably couldn't have been worse if it, well, I'll just, um, the, um, uh, so what, um, uh, so the, the, the current mechanisms that we're talking about would allow us 
to avoid the hellacious work of trying to rebuild DOM safety by intermediation. If instead we can create a, by other means, a confined environment in the browser in which we can give untrusted code direct access to DOM nodes, um, uh, then, um, uh, you know, then we don't need to build any of that other stuff. And also historically, most of our vulnerabilities were on the DOM wrapping side. So if we can avoid having to wrap the DOM, then we can also avoid a major source of vulnerabilities. Got it, thanks. Mm -hmm. So beyond that, SES version zero, uh, Jesse frame, SES frame version zero. Um, one, one major direction from Jesse frame would be to implement things like a gas model. Um, and to do that with source transforms when we're, when we're validating the code that we're loading. Okay, good. Uh, gas is a wonderful example of something that would be, uh, there, there are many reasonable implementation options uh, for how to do uh, gas for Jesse uh, that would not be reasonable applied to SES. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah, there are, you know, there are many options that would be reasonable for both, but Jesse certainly enables more reasonable engineering options for enforcing gas limits. Um, so having said that, I think we have a good direction for where to go. Uh, um, is there another topic that you'd like to take on? Uh, yeah, um, uh, this one's probably short, but it's another security important thing from TC39 that I forgot to report, uh, which is uh, the import expression. Um, uh, the import expression um, uh, broke what had been an invariant in JavaScript uh, which is um, that special powers could not be reached by syntax uh, in script code. And uh, the reason why I qualified that as with, you know, qualified that as uh, within script code is that uh, uh, the import statement in modules uh, really has all the same power as the import expression that are in both modules and scripts. Uh, the reason why the import expression was painful for us was because um, uh, the SES shim being based on uh, safely evaluating unvalidated strings, um, uh, this introduced a security hole uh, in safely evaluating unval unvalidated strings. Um, uh, but that's not, um, as SES um, uh, proceeds to have this other level to deal with modules in general, it'll have all the mechanisms needed to support the import expression as well, or at least that's what we should, that's what we need to do. Uh, in any case, the committee issue is that uh, import expressions are at stage three, they are already implemented across at least some browsers. I, I, don't, I don't remember, it might be all browsers, but it's at least two browsers. It meets all of the criteria for advancing to stage four. Um, and because we have not gotten enough of our module system working to be able to know with confidence that there's nothing about the import expression proposal that needs to be adjusted. Um, uh, I asked to postpone um, uh, the um, import expression graduating to stage four until the next meeting, which is first week of June. Um, 
And I did not ask for a stage interlock. It is not, it is not that realms need to proceed in stages in order to unlock uh, import expression going forward. It was just an issue of giving us, this community, another two months to try to shim the import expression in the realm shim to the point that we're confident that the spec as written uh, can go forward. Um, and at that point, we would simply allow it to proceed forward to stage four. If we find a problem, um, uh, you know, in an edge case, something that could be adjusted without breaking legacy code, um, uh, you know, then we would give that feedback and hopefully get the committee to agree uh, to fix the edge case. Um, and if there's some problem deeper than an edge case, uh, then we would have a, um, a significant problem because there's already a lot of legacy code that uses the existing import expression. So is the import expression um, just a function call or is it something special? Uh, the, uh, it's, the import expression looks like a function call, but import is a keyword. So the import expression is a special form. Uh, there is no lexical binding that you can shadow. Um, uh, it's, it's, um, uh, so it, it uh, directly accesses whatever uh, you know, loading service, whatever module loading service is provided in that environment. It accesses it dynamically with a potentially computed string. Um, uh, and, um, and it can appear both in scripts and in modules. And um, it returns a promise for the module object um, rather than returning the module object itself. The string that is fed to the import expression is is dereferenced according to the script or module it appears in. Um, uh, so the import statement in modules, a given specifier string is already sensitive to which module uh, uh, the import comes from. Uh, so you can do things like relative path name. Uh, the import expression does likewise except since it, can, since, since it can also appear in scripts, the spec was changed to say um, uh, 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 that the host, instead of getting a um, module record to say which module is doing the import, it instead now gives the host a script or module node. Um, but all the interesting information by which one script might differ from another, such that a host might act differently, is in a internal slot in the ECMAScript spec that is labeled impl implement or it's labeled host defined. Um, and I think I think that's basically a, a pretty uh, complete summary of the uh, import expression proposal. Okay, yeah, that's interesting having actually used it um, to see where that is a bit of a danger. But, um, so it, basically from, from the script environment, it can take it relative to the origin or relative to something that the host says it is? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's using, um, uh, the same kind of module name dereferencing machinery, but where that machinery has now been, you know, which is provided only by the host and which in the browser, there is no exposed API to intercept that, um, as opposed to with Node. Um, uh, um, you know, Bradley showed us the, the uh, hooks for intercepting those lookups in Node. Um, uh, and they, um, I wasn't, uh, 
presumably the thing that I that that I remembered as identifying the module in Node, I think says undefined when, if it comes from a script rather than a module, which is fine with me. Um, uh, the um, I'm sorry, I lost the question. Uh, it's okay. I didn't really have a question. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Jesse, uh, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, Jesse only supports modules, does not support scripts? Yes, that was the last conclusion we had. Okay, good, good. And does the Jesse grammar include the import expression? No. Okay, good. Yeah. What SES does right now at the SES kernel level where we only have evaluators is it uses a cheesy regular expression to scan for anything that looks like an import expression. Uh, include, and it might be that it appears inside a comment or inside a literal string, but no matter where it appears, if it matches the regular expression, then we just reject the string from safe evaluation. Um, and uh, so far that hasn't bitten us, but clearly that's a very silly thing to do. Uh, um, uh, the shim will probably continue to do that forever. Um, uh, while the shim exists and eventually the when the platform uh, replaces it with something spec conformant, then obviously this problem goes, this restriction goes away. Um, another thing that we had side conversations on at TC39 uh, that was stimulated by a mainline conversation uh, is, um, uh, do you guys know about this incredibly bizarre parsing rule for JavaScript scripts in the browser where they recognize HTML comment syntax? Uh, that's an annex um, 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 privilege for browsers, but it doesn't work uh, except in uh, very rare cases, I think. Uh, so my impression from talking to people I should need, I should, it's easy enough to independently verify. Uh, I know that it works in the browser um, uh, uh, and works across all browsers. I, um, my, my, my belief is that it actually works on Node in V8 as well, I'm sorry, on, on, yeah, on Node as well. Um, uh, um, uh, and, but it is an Annex B so that a conforming implementation can omit it. Uh, something I'd like to bounce off of this group before I propose it to the committee is uh, since a conforming JavaScript implementation might implement the HTML comment syntax or might not, and an HTML comment syntax run on a JavaScript that doesn't recognize it can also be part of valid JavaScript. So, uh, you know, there are these per perverse examples where you have one piece of JavaScript code that's valid under both interpretations, but means something completely different. Uh, and from a security perspective, that's, a, that's worse than um, uh, the fact that the existence of the bizarre syntax in the first place uh, is where you can't, you have to validate the code under two different syntactic interpretations in order to know what it means. Uh, so I am planning to propose that this crazy bizarre syntax be moved out of Annex B and into the main spec and made normative. Um, uh, um, it is important that even in Annex B, they're very careful to say it's only scripts, it is not modules. So this should not affect Jesse at all. So, so I'm glad that you raised that point because um, I, I actually have been trying to parse JavaScript for you know 
over six months now. Um, and yeah, no, yeah, I don't give up, right? So I get distracted trying to solve problems that, you know, are very discouraging. Um, and um, my problem is I did not see any of the um, existing tooling that, that, you know, I ran their source code because they tend to create this, uh, this files that have all the caveats of parsing. Um, so I've yet to see any one of those, you know, even accidentally, I wasn't really looking, uh, trying to actually parse that because it's an Annex B. Um, nobody is prepared for it. Um, I mean, if it, doesn't, if it doesn't run in your tooling, why is it in the language optionally? Um, but if it's, if it's actually valid in the browser and not valid elsewhere, then definitely it's a big loophole. So um, uh, it is valid across all browsers, or rather, you know, all browsers uh, operate uh, as, as specified in NXB. Um, uh, uh, it's also, I believe, uh, works the same way in Node because it comes from V8. Uh, the tooling issue is interesting. I hadn't thought about that, but yeah, uh, if Babel does not recognize it, then uh, that that's a really good reason to make a normative decision on this thing because for Babel to differ from what the what the engines do directly is also a security nightmare because now the meaning of your code depends on whether you've run it through a Babel translation or not. Um, and it can mean different things in different circumstances. Um, so that's, that's really terrible. If it becomes a normative part of the spec, then that sends a strong signal that Babel should recognize it, which they would. Um, uh, the reason why it exists is it um, was already recognized across all browsers before the spec said anything about it at all. Um, and one of the ways things accumulated in NXP uh, um, that I participated in, I mean, I should, I should do a mea culpa here. I don't remember if I was at fault on this particular one, but I, I, I may very well have been one of the voices pushing it into Annex B. Uh, in general, when there's something we're kind of forced to write down because all the browsers do it and you have to do it if you wanna be compatible with the web, but it's so ugly that you just can't stand to have it part of the normal language, uh, Annex B is, has kind of become a dumping ground for those things. Uh, and sometimes that was good and sometimes it wasn't. And this is a case where it wasn't. Yeah, so, so I found that Acorn treats it as a line comment. Yes, that's what NXB specifies. All right, so, so it's only expected to be a line comment, and that's maybe why I wasn't um, seeing that. Um, so uh, Babel, um, I, I really don't like looking at their source, and, and they keep moving it around. So if it doesn't come up, you know, I'm not going to go looking for it. Uh, is it called Babel Core now? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, uh, the acorn behavior, by the way, I remember that um, somebody responsibly disclosed a Kaha bug to Google. Um, that was a big deal at the time because, you know, actually Kaha is still protecting some, some you know, significant Google properties. Um, and, um, uh, we're depending on Acorn for something. Yeah. And somebody successfully uh, found a security hole in Kaha and fortunately responsibly disclosed it so we could fix it before we were attacked. Yeah. Hey, Sala, are you looking for Babel parser? Yeah, I, I went to Babylon because if, if that has it, uh, Babel will. Uh, but do you have a better suggestion? Oh God! Uh, I think Babylon is is now called Babel Parser. Uh, okay. So so, but look at that. Uh, I I I see that stuff, and I'm like, oh my God, who who's uh, doing plagiarism checks here? Those are two different libraries, Acorn and Babel. Hold on. Open open source. This is not. 
uh, plagiarism, uh, this is uh, imitation as a compliment. Oh, okay. So I compliment everyone then. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the I mean, it is um, polite to give credit where due, um, uh, but uh, reusing open source code rather than you know trying to clean room it uh, is you know much of what the payoff of doing things open source is. Yeah, no, like they always start off in the first few lines. I'm not going to scroll because those files are very huge and I'm using like literal DOM rendering. Uh, but usual, uh, yeah, there's an R. But usually in the first few lines, whenever they're plagiarizing, um, they, um, they, they may, I, I'm, I guess I'm writing the wrong package here. Babel parser. It might be scoped to Babel, I'm not sure. Oh, it's, yeah. it's at Babel slash parser. Babel slash parser? Try it that way first. Uh, you're probably right. Oh, look at that. I never use Babel. Like, Babel makes you think that you got it right. That's why I learned about Babel. And, and obviously, you never have it right. Oh. oh, it doesn't have a reference to this. So does it have XML? Oops, nope. But Babylon does, so whatever they did to, um, to get, uh, let's see if they have comment. Obviously they do, so how about line comment? Yeah, it's uh, not in the Babel parser uh, source, which is, um, yeah, I think it's the, It's a subset of the source that we need to be looking for. Yes. Another bizarre thing about this HTML comment is that anything that renders uh, JavaScript, that produces uh, JavaScript text from an AST, um, uh, uh, has to be careful not to accidentally produce an HTML comment, because you can have an a AST that if naively rendered into, if naively printed, uh, would actually produce um, uh, HTML comment strings. Yeah. So, so uh, I wasn't aware of the single line comment, um, um, you know, um, condition there. Um, mm -hmm. so, so to me, I've been operating under this assumption. Yeah. Over here, they they have it as logic, right? So. Um, I was operating under the assumption that I will find it with, with uh, multi-line um, comments, but I was proven wrong. Um, but then Babel seems to not do it declaratively or do it at all in, in Babel parser. Okay. Uh, so, so there is no reference to the word XML in Babel parser, but there is in Babylon. So, and... Um, uh, so this is this isn't XML. It's 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 HTML. I, even even if it happens to be the same as as however you con I don't have I actually have no idea how you write a comment in XML if at all. Um, uh, uh, let, let, with regard to uh, the impact of this, uh, in the same way that currently the SES shim or the Realm shim scans for the import expression uh, and uh, conservatively rejects. I think the uh, Realm shim should also uh, scan for a sequence of characters that look like an HTML comment and conservatively reject any text to be evaluated that has that sequence of characters. Yeah, it's 6033, um, two of those. <laughs> And 45, which is a, uh, yeah, whatever. Okay. So, so yeah, it was good to actually find it because, because, you know, like I don't really go looking for these uh, particular things, but it's good raising it now. Now I have to actually implement that too, but I'm not going to worry about it now. It just, um, yeah. So I, I wanted to actually quickly uh, show the draft that we were uh, 
putting together about the Jesse frame? Because it's the same architecture for um, SES, right? Great. Uh, awesome. So, but, so, so I'm, I'm basically, I really need like, um, um, to find good ways to stay focused on the right projects. So, so I do apologize for taking a while to actually build up momentum here. Um, and this is uh, being parsed by my broken parser <laughs> and, you know, rendered and everything by that. Is this um, available? Uh, yeah, so um, I have like an experimental uh, website uh, served from, um, from my GitHub repo directly. Yeah, Salah posted in the comments on the chat. Oh, it's already okay. Yeah. Okay, I see it. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, I'm building the resolver now, which uh, it's an SBA. So every invalid URL becomes converted into a hash. Uh, and then I use an SBA approach. But we started to flesh out um, some. Sorry, F SBA? Yeah, uh, single page application. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so like the render, the, everything is in, you know, done on the client side from markdown files, basically. Okay. So, yeah. Um, so, so SES frame is still here. Um, all, all I did is, um, you know, think of a way for me to get rid of my uh, distractions that are not helping me build the foundation of SES frame itself. Um, and, and I guess we came up with, an, with the interface of what I would expect Jessica to provide in the global scope of the service worker. Um, service workers are notoriously very, very hard to debug. Uh, the best platform for, for debugging them is really Chrome. Um, the only platform they don't have as much trouble with is actually Chrome. <laughs> so if, if you need to debug it, um, you're likely not going to be in Chrome. Um, but long story short, they only import script. They don't have import module support. Uh, mm -hmm. At least um, when my hopes were up a few months back, uh, I was, you know, um, I, I, I was pulled back by this realization that, um, you know, they still don't support modules. Um, so we wanted to think of what a global method in the service worker um, would be like if Jessica and the rest of the uh, architecture are integrated. Um, and basically the, um, the architecture will um, have a particular asset that it knows is a Jessica um, bound um, resource that needs to go through a translate or a validate or whatever method. We still don't know what the methods we need here will be. Um, so we just pick translate for now. Um, because we might, it might be that the code will be um, um, compartmentalized in some way. We don't know exactly at this point, um, but it will get a readable. For now, it's a string, and it will get certain parameters, and it will return a promise. That promise will resolve to source that can be returned to the frame, who is, which is fetching that particular asset. Um, so, so basically, this was the important interface point for integration between um, the work I'll be doing and the work um, that Michael was doing already. Um, and we, we talked about what this object, the parameters object, could look like as, a, as an early draft. Um, and we picked um, names that don't conflict with things like source map, the way they use the word source URL, for instance, or, or stuff like that. Just thinking down the road, if, if code will be changed, uh, code has to be resource mapped. Um, these are you know, complexities we don't want to deal with now, but we don't want to end up 
uh, I, I ran into a lot of problems overlapping with names for source maps in uh, other uh, areas. So, so I think the idea that we um, ensure uh, just to pick the right names was really the height of our discussion. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, so I guess that's really what we have um, in, in that document that we're working on. And I'm basically uh, focusing this week um, on, you know, coming up with my infrastructure that will utilize this, um, um, yeah, this point of convergence, basically. Okay, this sounds like a, um, I'm really glad you went through that. Um, uh, this, uh, it's now 2.56. Uh, I think this is a good stopping point. Uh, and I actually have a three o'clock meeting. Um, so um, uh, Kate has already signed off uh, uh, and she's the one who started the recording. Uh, uh, Solid, do you know uh, if I, if um, what, how to stop the recording? Can any of us just hit the stop button or can I hit the stop button? I think we all can. Uh, I'll stop sharing first and then I'll see. Uh, yeah, so I can stop it from my end. Should I do that? Yes, please. Uh, okay. Uh, just one last thing, Mark. Um, yeah. 